Hello everyone and welcome back to the Decarbonisation Summit in partnership with SSE. You've joined us for the Gender, Diversity and Decarbonisation panel. Uh, I'm Scott Stanglands, sustainable, sustainability consultant, journalist and influencer. I'm proud to have been asked to host today's panel um, and with some amazing speakers here joining us in person. The panel is sponsored by Go With Flow, a pioneering company that manages thousands of electric vehicles and EV charging stations around the world. Go With Flow are committed to equality and representation within the sustainability sector and are actively working to ensure that the switch to renewables is inclusive and accessible to everyone. We're going to address underrepresentation in the conversations around climate change and the importance of inclusion in delivering decarbonisation. Climate change has a disproportionate effect on women and girls, those from poorer backgrounds and indig indigenous communities. Today we want to address how we represent all voices in the battle against climate change. Let me introduce our speakers. We've got Eleanor Evzani, is Global, Global Sustainability Director at Oracle, driving Oracle's strategy on the development of sustainability enabling cloud solutions. Geraldine Michel is Chief Marketing Officer at Connected Curb, whose vision is to create smart, sustainable and future-proof streets for pedestrians, cyclists and drivers. Jane Hoffer is CEO at Go With Flow, at the forefront of the worldwide EV adoption, fleet electrification and charge point management. Nikki Flanders is Managing Director of Energy Customer Solutions at SSE and long-standing advocate for inclusion and diversity in the workplace. Penelope Hope is co-founder and CCO at Rebel Energy, the UK's first for-profit renewable energy supplier with a social mission to rebuild, restore and renew. And we also have Nizreen al Saim, who's hoping to join us a little bit later. Um, she's the chair of the UN Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change, passionate about climate change and environmental government as well as having a master's degree in renewable energy. And I'm sure some of you yesterday will have seen her speech amongst Boris Johnson and huge government advisors where she absolutely grilled them and it was brilliant. Um, to start today's panel, we've got an address from Shetha Chakrabarti. So um, we'd just like to play a short video from her. My name is Dr. Shetha Chakrabarti. I am the US president of We Don't Have Time, the world's largest social network and review platform for the climate. I'm a behavioral scientist applying my expertise to moving individual and diverse groups of people to come together, amplify their efforts, and effectively confront the climate crisis. We need all hands on deck. And to get people to act, they need information that is relevant, helpful, timely, and credible. How this information is delivered must take into account all the diverse stakeholders around the world that we must activate. Getting the messaging right and appropriately tailored is critical for the collaboration needed for widespread behavioral change. Why is diversity and inclusion so important? Not only is fair representation a right, but it is also good for business. Equitable organizations outpace their competitors by respecting the unique needs, perspectives, and potential of all their team members. Without a diverse leadership mix, we will fall short of the creative ingenuity we require for a successful green transformation. A green transformation that could be the growth story of the 21st century. Everyone should be given the opportunity to contribute to this effort and to benefit from its outcomes. Together, we can usher in a more equitable future. I'll conclude with a question for the esteemed panelists, all of whom embody diversity and leadership. As women leading the charge in your respective organizations, what are the immediate and long-term challenges that still need to be overcome to truly see the power and benefit of having women in critical decision-making roles? So just for everyone at home and people here in the audience, the question, as women leading the charge in your respective organizations, what are the immediate and long-term challenges that need to be overcome to truly see the power and benefit of having, having women in leadership and decision-making roles? So I'd love to start at this end of the panel, if you could introduce yourself and your background um, and then give some context to the, to the question. <clears throat> sure. And thank you for inviting me, first of all. I'm, you know, I'm so you know, pleased to be here and this is a topic I'm really passionate about. I um, run our course Global Sustainability Program. Uh, I'm the Global Sustainability Director. I joined Oracle in uh, back in 1998. So I've been with the company for many years, but um, the sustainability initiative was launched in 2008 and I'm one of the two founding members of the, of the program. I wear two hats. I coordinate all the global initiatives, but I also 
work closely with our customers, our sales teams, um, to design technology solutions that enable our customers to be sustainable. If you're not familiar with Oracle, um, we are a, a technology and cloud providers. We work with more than 430,000 large organizations and, and governments. So we think that, you know, beyond going, you know, towards like our own, you know, uh, sustainability program and carbon footprint, the way we make a difference is by helping these governments and organizations to run a sustainable business. So that is like, you know, a little bit of my background. I'm an industrial engineer. I was talking to Jane about, you know, the fact that when I graduated, I was, uh, you know, one of 20 girls in a class of maybe like 250 you know, 300 uh, boys. Um, so I'm familiar with the challenge of being an engineer, a woman engineer in, uh, in, um, uh, in a you know, male uh, space. Uh, and I think, you know, if you look at the challenges we're facing now is, you know, we, we are not represented, you know, at the highest level of power. Right? Only uh, um, you know, 5% of uh, CEOs in the US are women and 7% uh, in the FTSE uh, 100 in the UK. So we are not there where decisions are, uh, are made and that brings um, uh, a challenge because you know, we, as men and women we are complementary. You know, women think long term, men take more risk, which is great, you know, especially in, you know, in, in entrepreneurship, but then especially for uh, a challenge like climate change, we need both perspectives, right? And uh, in uh, cloud computing, I think you know, only 50% of, uh, of the workforce uh, is female, uh, similar percentages in AI and data management. In the UK, only 13% of uh, STEM uh, um, jobs are, are with women. So we need, uh, we need more representation, we need more uh, presence, and, uh, and there are you know, a number of reasons why that happens. We, we can talk about that later. Yeah, definitely, we'll get into those later. Geraldine, John's going next. Yeah, sure, hi. Um, so I'm the Chief Marketing Officer um, at Connected Curb, and um, I've been working in the mobility industry for over six years now. And I guess I can relate to what you just said, uh, although I, I guess my background is not STEM, it's always been marketing and business overall. Uh, but actually, it's the same. Uh, I think since the early years when I started uh, working in the finance industry, uh, and uh, you end up being part of management meeting when you're 25 or 26, and you're always the only woman. And actually, it hasn't changed that much. It has changed. Uh, but I think that's why uh, that topic is so close to my heart because I feel like throughout the years uh, as a woman leader uh, in the industry, uh, it's also up to you to make sure that you're going to be providing all the set of tools that women are going to be needing, whether it's going to be, you know, education, I'm sure we're going to talk about it uh, a lot more, but also uh, mentoring, helping with networking uh, opportunities. And I guess as a company, it's not just up us as women, but men also need to step up. And I think it's something that we're only starting uh, to see now. Um, and I guess a little bit of a story at Connected Curve, which is quite interesting. When I joined back in September 2020, we were 16. And I believe there were three or four women in the company and mostly very much white male at the time. Uh, and now, uh, over a year later, we're over, you know, 55 people uh, and 35% of our workforce uh, is female. And when you look at uh, the people that we've hired in 2021, 40% are women. Uh, and you're talking about uh, an infrastructure industry, EV industry is really not female led at all. So we're not there yet. We're not perfect, but we're trying. So it's the power in the progress, isn't it? And exactly. I, I also have worked in the automotive sector, and you're right, there, there are women in the organisation, but the diversity in the roles is also something that needs addressing. It's the marketing, the HR roles, and not the engineers, and those sorts of roles that are still male-centric. So, Jane, you also work closely in EVs and charging infrastructure. Have you got some similar experience and challenges? Um, most certainly. Hi, I'm, I'm Jane Hoffer. I'm the, the CEO of Go With Flow. Um, I recently actually came into the EV world. Um, my background goes all the way back. I'll, I'll do the quick introduction. So I'm an electrical engineer by education. Um, 
much to my father's chagrin, as I say, who was an engineer for Bell Labs. Uh, I went to work for IBM in sales as my first uh, jo a job out of, out of university. But it was great because it was a combination of technology and communications. And I think that's something that has sort of informed what I think is necessary as we through, uh, through organizations, but I spent a short amount of time at IBM and then I became an entrepreneur. And I've been an entrepreneur and a startup executive for my, pretty much my entire career. And I know we'll talk about some of these things along the way, but the challenges uh, in startups, in leadership and funding for startups for women is, is well noted. Um, and so I have had the opportunity, so I had my own company, took it public uh, and sold it in 2009. Uh, and then since then, I've actually joined other firms to help uh, startup CEOs, um, two of the three were women, to help them grow their businesses. And then most recently came to go with Flow as, as the CEO role, moving from the US to Portugal um, and experiencing a different culture in that. And so from a leadership perspective, um, the challenges that I've seen really are about how do you create that diversity? How do, you, how do you change the balance of people within your organization? And very similar, I think, to Geraldine. We're roughly the same size of company. Um, same statistics, almost identical to when I joined in uh, January of 2020 to where we are today. And I would say that we've been super successful in adding women to the ranks. Um, from product to engineering to marketing to, uh, to sales. So it's, it's our intent to really look to, to be able to, as leaders, make sure it's representative. Perfect. And uh, Nikki, as managing director as well, I'm sure you've seen as you've gone up the, the ranks in a, in a big organization, the challenges uh, along that process as well. Could you shed some light there as well? Sure. So, so maybe just a quick intro yeah. first. So, so I'm Nikki Flanders, one of the managing directors at SSE. Um, responsible for customer solutions. So I work with a team of 1,500 people, really great team, and our job is to service over 1.3 million customers, helping them on their net zero journey. And that could be right from supplying renewable energy direct from our wind farms to installing solar, so a whole, a whole remit. And within our organisation, you know, we have very technical, um, sort of abled specialists, we have customer service agents, and I think this is the thing, you know, STEM is absolutely critical, and I know we're going to talk about education, but in order to get to net zero, we need a very, you know, sort of broad diversity of thought. This is a massively complex subject we're dealing with, and across all of the skill sets, we need to have diversity represented. I mean, my career um, spans over 25 years, um, and if I, you know, if I just look back, the first 15 years were really tough um, to get a female voice heard at the right table. Um, I've definitely seen an improvement over the last 10 years, and I would say in the last five years, a real acceleration in terms of leaders thinking about diversity. And, you know, and Geraldine said it in terms of we've also got to step up. So, for example, one of the uh, key decisioning points about me joining SSE 24 months ago um, was that I wanted to work for a company that aligned with my values. And that was about the values of destination in terms of net zero, but how we get there. So as part of my interview process, and it was a two-way interview, um, a lady called Rosie McRae, who's our sort of chief uh, sort of inclusion and diversity officer, she was part of my inter interview process. And I was saying to Rosie, you know, are you really doing this? Can you show me the stats? And that's why I joined. And I joined a company who I could see had belief in what I believed in, in terms of diversity and inclusion. So I think, you know, in terms of looking at what we need to get to, societal norms, um, we've got some great role models in terms of breaking down the conventional view of society, whatever that is now. We've got some great role models that are really disrupting that. Education and then leadership and making sure it's systemic in our organisations. I think that's a really key point there that, um, having those people in for the conversation, mm. even if, right from the interview process as well, and having them aligned with that. We, I always see in research, it's we would, we would, we would, if, 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 mm -hmm. but then what are you actually doing? Yep. And I think moving on to Penelope now, like the rebuild, restore and renew part is really key on the, the values that you have as a company, but also ties into diversity and inclusion and those sorts of things too. Um, could you do a quick intro for us and, uh, and shed some light on the question? Sure, thank you, Scott, and I think that's a great question. Um, so I am the co-founder and CEO of a company called Rebel Energy. Um, we're the first for-profit renewable energy supplier to go to market with a social mission alongside an environmental one. I think that's just so important. Um, when we look at the sustainable development goals at the UN, for instance, they cover all sorts of things from ecology, biodiversity, social justice, education. It's really important that we treat those things as one. So I've spent the last couple of years building that business. 
Um, it's aimed at helping those who are living in fuel poverty. Um, one in 10 households in the UK would be classified as fuel poor. That's um, children growing up with respiratory conditions, um, pensioners dying of hypothermia, parents making choices about whether they put food on the table or they put the radiators on. Um, and I think treating environmental and social issues together is absolutely essential. Um, to your point about including women, one of the things I'm most proud of is our executive board, our non-executive leaders. We have three females and three males. Um, it's so refreshing to be part of those conversations. And I just know that it um, gives exactly the right kind of leadership and direction to our company. So really proud of that. That's excellent. Um, for everyone at home, please do send in some questions in the chat bar. And if you could put a name next to the, next to the question as well, so I know who to direct the question to, that'd be great. Um, so we know that te technological solutions are the key to decarbonisation. Um, we've talked about how women are dangerously underrepresented in STEM careers. Um, so how do we pave the way for women in these sectors? And perhaps Jane, do you want to address that one? Sure. Um, I think digging into the STEM numbers, I think there's actually positives because, in, in fact, actually, I think the numbers that Pew Research has put forward is that over 50% or roughly 50% of women are, are in STEM, uh, STEM careers. The challenge is when you dig in, there's a high propensity in healthcare and, and services and science related, and it's very low representation in computer-based businesses and hardware and engineering. So, so the challenge is there to how do we get um, more, uh, more students and more children, more girls involved. And it, I think it starts at an early age. I mean, I have been was very involved early in, in Philadelphia in a group called Tech Girls. And it was aimed really at preteen and early teen uh, girls to help them understand what technology really is be before they turn off, right? Because they turn off math and science if they're going to, to, to make those decisions right around that time. And, and what we did was we, we tried to really create role models. This is what a woman in technology looks like. And it can be in marketing. It can be in engineering. It can be in product. You can be creative um, so, that, you, th so that, that representation is there because it starts with a sp aspiration and opening the doors to that. And then from there, there's lots of other things that I'm sure others would like to add to. But I think it really starts. We need to really continue to build programs at the earliest. Definitely. I'm all for that. Um, when I hear like the word feminist as well, it's always like female associated, but there's also the male in the room as well that has mm -hmm. the option to be feminist or express the views of the opposite gender that might not be in the room. So if we're waiting for people to be in them roles, we're going to be waiting too long. You may as well take that conversation as a lead yourself. So Nikki, do you want to shed some light on the STEM career and, and that sort of the question there? Mm. Just before I do, I just want to sort of make a, a, a personal comment. So. I, I personally would much rather people talk about diversity of thought yeah. rather than feminist, rather right. than, you know, et cetera. So I think, you know, we've really got to make sure that we are, as leaders, open to that diversity of thought. So my background isn't STEM. Um, my background is um, sort of general business. So I came up through, through retail. So I'm a, I'm a retailer. And, and I think, you know, one of the opportunities for us, um, all of us, you know, running, running businesses, running teams, is to make sure that we are actively making those interventions to bring diversity at the table. So some of the things that you know we we do and I've seen done very successfully are like shadow boards. So that you know get your shadow boards together in terms of different you know levels of experience, different sort of professional maturity, different voices to really challenge the decisions that the leadership team are making. And that's quite a shift, because as a leader, you've got to be very open to A, sharing what your decision is and why, and most importantly, to listen. And, and I think we know we've got this amazing opportunity um, with, with net zero, clearly we have got to get to 1.5, but the amazing opportunity is that we do it in a way that brings people with us. And I would love, I would just love, you know, if I ever become a grandmother, my son's only 13, it's a bit premature, but, you know, if I ever become a grandmother to be able to say to my grandkids that this generation actually didn't have those age boundaries. So as an example, we went into a school in Ireland and we retrofitted the school. And one of the students, a young lady called Victory Luke, was really impassioned about what we were doing. And she's, she's a climate activist. And we now work with her, she works with us. So we actually ask her, you know, can you help us? And I was with her in Belfast a few weeks ago and I said, what advice would you give? I boil it down to two things. One, she said, please keep the momentum. And secondly, she said, please share. And she was saying, you know, about blending that experience that people have in terms of longevity of career and professional experiences to, to you know, being open to new thoughts and ideas. And so wouldn't it be great if when we're, you know, grandparents, if we can say, actually, this generation 
regardless of age, had a united aim. And that united aim is to get to 1.5. And how we did there was that we included everybody, that we appreciated everyone's diversity of thought. So that's why I, I, I sort of would steer away from various titles and you know, various sort of labels and really think about the diversity that we all bring. Yeah, I think that's been a real key theme of the decarbonisation summit so far is the collaboration. Um, and when, to my mind, when I think of diversity, you can't have diversity without inclusivity. And mm -hmm. diversity is putting someone at the table and inclusivity is giving them a voice yeah. as well. It's not just they're here. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. listening and learning and Opening taking that change door. from them. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I think something that Jane and, and yourself uh, pertain to was the education part of it. So um, in your opinions, what, what role does education play in our, edu in our educational institutions? And uh, Elena, we spoke just before we started on yeah. this. Do you want to start as well? Well, the first thing we have to do is to get girls in school to begin with. There are more than 130 million girls that don't go to secondary um, uh, schools and education uh, for a number of reasons, you know, conflict, you know, gender bias, uh, um, uh, cost, uh, uh, wars, uh, poor quality of education, especially in refugees camp. And, um, that's, that's a huge missed opportunity. The um, Brookings Institute uh, established that uh, you know, getting girls educated is one of the uh, key solutions for climate change. Project Drawdown, which is a, an amazing nonprofit that has done a lot of research on these uh, issues, has estimated that just by getting um, girls uh, educated and focusing on family planning, you could abate um, 35 gigatons of 85 gigatons of uh, cargo, carbon emissions by 2050. And just to give you the sense of the scale, uh, to get to 1.5, we need to abate 22 gigatons by 2030. So this is a, a, a really important uh, aspect of you know, decarbonizing uh, our economy. And also that would bring uh, growth in terms of you know, economic uh, output, you know, estimated to 12 uh, trillion US dollar by, by 2030. So there is a huge opportunity in bringing development and bringing women uh, uh, you know, as part of the solution. Um, so that's the first thing, you know, get, get girls to school to begin with. Then obviously we can focus on educating uh, girls on STEM. Uh, which has a huge potential. And I agree on diversity of thoughts, but we really need women to build the algorithms that we are embedding in AI because yeah. that, that you know, is now like the domain of men and they're, you know, they're missing a lot of data points. <laughs> in yeah. well, they need diversity in it. Yeah. That's they the whole need point. diversity, yeah. exactly. So. Does anyone else want to jump in on the education part as well, Penelope? Um, well, I think obviously it's really important to bring um, young women to, into those STEM degrees and it's really inspiring to see Jane and Elena having gone through that process. Um, I'm probably a good example of someone who didn't go through that route. I read ancient languages at university, um, then I joined an investment bank, then I helped startups grow and raise capital, and then I found myself being a founder in my own right. And I never could have imagined myself in the energy sector, but what a phenomenal journey it's been. I've really enjoyed every minute. It's incredibly challenging and stimulating. So I I think it's important to remember that we can attract women from different sorts of um, thought profiles, if you like. Um, and also there's training on the job and there's apprenticeships. There's many different ways that we can learn other than just going to university. And for some people who might not be academically minded, it's important to keep those avenues open. Mm. Totally. I think the, the education doesn't just end at school as well. If whatever field you go into, you can be educated within that organization around certain things and so on. Jodine, I know you've grown quite quickly at your organization as well. Perhaps you could talk a bit about the acquisition side and when you're recruiting and things that you look for externally from candidates that from people that might be viewing online and things you, you might uh, encourage them to do or say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think overall it's really being more open-minded about the profiles of candidates that you might consider and going back to gender bias. Uh, you know, not necessarily considering uh, women for operation and delivery. And I think we've got a great example at Connected Curve because you would think uh, typically uh, operation and delivery being, you know, male uh, oriented really. Uh, and actually we've made some absolutely amazing hiring with young women. 
uh, who are quite, you know, quite starting, they're quite junior, and they're actually going to be the ones leading the way for the company. We always tend to think about the leadership role, but actually I think that if uh, younger women who are still at school see that women of 25, 30 are actually able to have great jobs, uh, you know, at great startups, making a real uh, difference and being part of those operation and delivery teams, I think that makes uh, a huge difference. So I don't think they realize right now, I can actually name Lee and Sui, they might actually uh, recognize themselves, but they are making an absolutely, you know, truly huge difference for, for the company. So it's, it's really all about trying to look at different profiles that we would not have considered um, otherwise. And yes, diversity is not just about women, it's also age. Uh, when I mentioned before that, we used to be quite a white male-led company and now it's changed completely. It's also a question of age. Mm. We used to be quite an older company actually mm. for startup. Uh, and now it's really varied from, you know, 20-ish uh, to uh, 50 mm. uh, and different nationalities as obviously you can tell, I'm sure. Uh, and, uh, and I guess all of that makes us stronger and uh, it enables us to actually, going back to designing product, making sure that we have uh, different views on you know, how the product should be designed from an accessibility perspective for women. Uh, is the charger gonna be too heavy, mm. for right. instance? Um, so all of those things, I think if we didn't have the diversity within the team, I don't think we would have got to where we are right now, just, you know, just in a year. I really like that uh, dissociation between like your CEOs and your bosses and your managers and your leaders. It's just because they're at one end of your global, your organization doesn't mean that they're not a leader. They can join the company and be there first day and you would absolutely follow them and be passionate about the things that they're passionate about. And the, the disruptive voices are just so powerful now and the next generation are obviously going to be much better than I am at this and hopefully a lot of the people at COP26 too. So they're, they're the voices that we should be championing too. And if I can, sorry, yeah, absolutely. add something to that. Um, I'm the product of a co-op system. So I worked my way through, through university and what became clear to me was that I had this impression until I had that experience that people knew more than I did, you know, or they had so much, they had, they had so much experience. So therefore I couldn't, I, I couldn't say something at the table. Um, but I quickly figured out that that wasn't the case. Um, and this is something that I'm, and I think it just build, builds on this is that if we give, and we've been talking about this with some of the folks on our team here this week, if we, if we stretch those individuals, if we give them an opportunity, they will, they will step up. I mean, it's a really interesting generation of, of individuals that are coming into our businesses that we can, um, that, that we really can drive very quickly into roles of, uh, uh, of leadership and into contribution. And, and it's a, the diverse group of, of folks that we're talking about. I was going to um, join it up with the, the venture capital and like the funding rounds and things like that. We, we spoke previously about yeah. when you're in those situations, you're asking for investment. The people you're asking investment for are people that are usually yeah. white, male, older. So can you maybe touch on the challenges there and um, your experiences from that as well? Yeah, I think I'm gonna write a book at some point. Um, so I um, was 29 when I wrote, would be, first became the CEO of a company that I, I bought out um, in an asset purchase. And I went then to raise venture capital and I was um, visibly pregnant. I'm with our second child, and uh, this was the start sort of of multiple uh, capital raises, but it was very clear that women, you know, you can't hide that you're pregnant, and when you're raising capital, I mean, the questions that came up were astounding. I mean, I don't think they're that different today, but I was asked not the question of my financials, I was asked how will I take care of my children? Um, and, and it's just a completely inappropriate question, for sure, but it's what's on the mind of the, the, the investors. Um, and so to Scott, Scott and I were talking, I mean, that was a, a bit back, but over the years, I've done a number of uh, many capital raises, and often it's the men at the table. I had an educational software company about connecting grandparents and grandkids, and I was pitching to a 35 non, you know, 35 white male who didn't have kids, and so they didn't understand why it would be compelling for, for someone to invest. Um, so, I mean, the investment figures are actually also in, in, in impacted by the number of women in, in VC. Right, so when you look at, at the numbers today, but 25% of uh, venture professionals are women, only 25%. When you start to get to the, the partner level, it's down to about 16. You get to the managing director level, it's, it's less than 10%. Mm -hmm. 
And in 2020, only 2.3% of investment dollars went to women-led businesses when there was a surge of venture capital into the, into the market in 2020, but it was going to large institutions that are represented by, by, by men. So it, it's, we, it's, it needs to be a virtuous cycle. So women need to be funded, um, you know, diverse groups. And, and I, going to the point is like a diverse board, a diverse leadership team performs, outperforms, yeah. um, and the statistics show it dramatically. But we need, you know, we need more women in positions that are, are building businesses, exiting businesses, getting capital that they can then put back uh, into the market. And so I'm super, as you can tell, passionate about this topic. And there's a huge amount of talent that we're just not tapping into. I mean, if we think about, I think it's, it's less than 30% in the UK of STEM students that are female, for example. But we know that there's a high dropout rate. We know that that dropout rate is even sort of finish your degree before you then go into a STEM job. It goes down to 24%. And then we know that actually over the next five years that that 24% gets lower. So, you know, SSE and lots of companies are actually doing some really great programs in terms of return to work. And I think your point there around, you know, having someone who's 35, isn't a grandparent, doesn't understand the product. You know, this is, this is coming up with age diversity as well. And we have got, you know, a really rich source of talent um, that as employers, we need to get back into the workplace. They want to get back into the workplace um, and we need to provide those, those sort of options. So I think that would be my other plea to anyone watching who's actually in a sort of position of being able to make that happen. We've got a lot of talent today that we're not utilising mm. and we've got to act quickly. On, on that then, we've, um, we need to ensure everyone's needs are considered and met in all sectors. Obviously, we've got a diverse range of industries here as well. Um, so like from transport to housing and energy, um, everyone benefits from decarbonisation, not just in the long term, but with immediate effects. So how can we increase the representation immediately and now? What sort of strategies can we put in place and who are we relying on or holding accountable for it? Perhaps Penelope, yeah. Sure. You know, I think if every man in the energy sector were to recruit another woman, we would have solved this problem by Christmas. Um, I went to an investor conference yesterday. There were 26 companies pitching for seed capital. 24 out of those 26 were led by men. Of the two that were led by women, one zoomed in from Australia. The other was so nervous when she got up to talk that she was underwhelming with her pitch. I don't blame her. I would have been so nervous in that situation too. The thing that worried me most about that conference was that those ratios were the same as when I was going to investor conferences 10 years ago. Mm. Um, we've got to do more, and we are reliant on men for them to support us. I'm so lucky in my position. Our founder and our CEO recruited me to be his co-founder. I would never have imagined myself in that role, but he understands what women add to profitability. He understands that women have to be up front and center if we're going to meet our long-term goals for carbon reduction. So I would really love to see um, men looking within their families, relatives, friends, professional network, bringing more women into the sector. And I think we could very quickly balance the ratios. And I think this is when we come to the issue of target. So, so I have to be honest, back in 2011, was it, um, when, when Lord Davis published the gender um, gap report, I, I was quite concerned about it because I thought, you know, I didn't want to get my next promotion and people to say, oh, well, she's only got it because of, a, you know, a target. I've completely changed my view now. Um, and, and I think we absolutely do need targets because in business, you get what you measure. And, um, you know, we need to make sure that those targets are appropriate for the sector. You know, we can't, we can't expect all of a sudden that, you know, we're, we're going to go from where we are today and, in, in, you know, overnight change. But we need to see steady, fast progress. And I think, you know, I think it's positive um, that since the Hampton Alexander report, which targeted in 2016 that 33% of FTSE 100 boards would, would have um, you know, women representation that we're now at 36%. But as you just mentioned, 7% you know, of women in terms of uh, CEOs at FTSE 100. So, so for me, the targets need now to be more granular. The targets we, we were saying about makes business sense. We know um, actually that this isn't a belief, this is a fact. And the fact is that organizations who have gender diversity on their board outperform the average of their peer group by 25%. We know that boards that have ethnic diversity outperform their peer group by 36%. You know, this just makes good business sense. And so the targets have got to be challenging, stretching, and people held to account. I totally agree. 
Um, so we've had some really good. Sorry, Jane. Yeah, Sorry, please do. Sorry, just to add something that, that I found to be super successful as well for us is that um, if we hold our team that's doing talent acquisition um, or the recruiters that we work with yeah. to present a, a slate of candidates for any of the positions that's balanced. Um, across diverse and you know gender and diversity, um, ethnic diversity, etc., it'll just improve because I mean I've tested this a number of times. Most recently, I worked with a, a fabulous recruiter, Jenny Gladman from Bright Smith Group here in the UK in clean tech, and and this was the agreement that we had, and she was amazing about it. And it just it, it produces results if you measure it. You, I mean, if you're yeah. saying I'm not going to accept and start interviewing until I have a, a balanced candidate slate. That's really that important. And, and also maybe one point um, to highlight regarding transport. So we know that transport is one of the, um, you know, one of the main sources when it comes down to carbon emission. And actually, women only represent 22 percent of the transport industry, uh, and that means that women face challenges that men don't. Uh, that goes from safety and security. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're not going to be uh, necessarily thinking about taking public transport, walking, biking, uh, early in the morning, late at night, or actually in the middle of the day if uh, you know the streets are completely deserted. Um, and equally uh, for people in wheelchairs, or if you're going to be with a stroller and grocery bags, even if you do want to take the bus, you might not have the choice. And the thing that's really frustrating is that women actually uh, are the ones who want to be making the changes necessary for their families when it comes down to climate change more than men. Uh, and I guess on top of that, uh, women tend to be a little bit uh, less enthusiastic about new technologies, which means that when you think about ride hailing or e-scooters, for instance, uh, these are created by male and men tend to be using those new technologies a lot more, which means that Basically, women don't have the same access to society, period. And they don't have the same access to the job market as well. Uh, so thinking about what can we do about it, I think education, we've talked about it, access to STEM, we've talked about it. And also companies that are in transport, in transport to be hiring more women and really do their part about it. Because going back to designing all the different transport options that we have, if you don't have diversity and more women in those roles, you're not going to be actually um, yeah, creating uh, the right type of uh, tri transport options that you need. And also elect women, because mm -hmm. women who are going to be elected are the ones who are going to be creating transport of today, but also transport of uh, tomorrow. And that is what is going to be making a huge difference. So basically, by having increasing the representation of uh, women and having better vi visibility for women in transport, um, will make better access to the job market for women uh, and to society in general. So yeah, that's transport is is a big one. I think I've really noticed that in automotive. Actually, only recently have women only been marketed to for a car, which is crazy. All, every marketing campaign that we see is male-centric in male magazines, in, in tradition, traditional media that is not female-centric. And only now, I think Vogue, obviously I work in fashion, Vogue is only just the last year and a half ago started having car placement ads in their, in their magazines now, which has been a huge benefit to them that, to have an audience that drives. Like Obviously, women drive cars, so now there is, finally there's, there's that placement. Um, on that a little bit, we've got um, just a question um, from our audience, um, it, Jane and Nikki both mentioned that it's it's profitable to to seem green and to seem diverse. So um, companies around the world are rushing to present themselves as both green and diverse. How can we ensure this goes beyond marketing campaigns and translates into real meaningful action? I mean, I think for me, it's it's what I said really. I think you know this is why we do need targets, and and those targets are you know across carbon emissions and diversity. So it's a 1.5 and how we get there. I mean, obviously, the 1.5 being the global target. So, you know, companies need to have those individual targets and they need to be filtered down. So not just sitting at the board level, every, you know, dependent on your size of organisation, every division needs to have their own target. Every leader, every recruiting manager, as Jane was saying, needs to have that accountability that they're going to make sure they've got a diverse um, recruitment list and that we're actually challenging people's unconscious bias. And so we need to have those processes in place and that we measure and we report on them. So... For me, that's how we're going to ensure companies are held to account. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, in, in addition, I think we need to sort of peel back in an organization and really look within to see what are the practices that you have. So, for example, um, within Oracle, what are what are you doing actually to make your own supply chain and your employees and and, and go with flow as well? What, how can you enable um, decarbonized? commuting behaviors? How can you electrify your fleet? Are you, in fact, actually taking the, the steps within your organization that you need to and setting the examples for, uh, for your own employees and enabling the employees to be able to take their own actions? Sure. Yeah, and if I can chime in, we yes, also sure. need regulations, right? So uh, right now we are in a, in a, uh, in a world where you know, we voluntarily report on our targets and we respond to investors' requests, but it's not a like, consistent set of metrics and KPIs that you, you can look at to really measure your performance. And it's coming, you know, we, you know, we, are, we have uh, um, seen that the IFRS, which is the Foundation for uh, Accounting Standards, has issued a, a, a new uh, set of, of standards for sustainability reporting that will provide consistency in how you measure your performance and that will, you know, bring the CFO at the table and it, this becomes like a board issue. And then you know, there is the EU taxonomy that is asking companies to report on how they are investing their money in how that class is, you know, is uh, related to climate adaptation and um, uh, pollution, diversity, water conservation. So you really need to uh, measure uh, your performance before you can manage. And then we'll bring accountability and transparency. Totally. Um, I'm very happy to say Nizreen has managed to join us as well. So um, I'd just like to intro Nizreen if you want to tell us a bit about yourself and the organisations that you work for and actually your experience of COP as well so far. Um, work with, we don't work for organisations with, with, with <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is Nizreen Asaim, I'm from Sudan. I'm the chair of the US Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. Um, I have a bachelor degree in physics and a master's degree in renewable energy technologies. I'm also the chair of the Sudan Youth Organization on Climate Change and um, I've been doing this <laughs> almost for 10 years now, um, 10 years exactly in 2022 January um, and glad to be with these magnificent ladies and you of course. So how's your experience been at COP yesterday? I know you as part of a panel um, with some very high up government ministers holding them accountable. Uh, <coughs> we're obviously talking about gender and diversity here. What have you seen in your experience? You've been doing this for quite a long time as a youth activist role as well. So what have you seen across the board in, in terms of that? Well, um, when it comes to, to gender and um, young activists thing, it's, um, it's so overwhelming because in a lot of times we get very much discriminated because of our gender and because of our age more than anything else. Um, and I can give hundreds of examples. Uh, I was speaking in a high-level event uh, on the 2nd of November at COP, and, um, and the security guy told me, like, this is a uh, head of state level event. You cannot be a speaker there. So I had to actually take out uh, a video of me speaking on the 1st of November with um, 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 Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the rest of the Prime Ministers. I show him the video and say, this is me yesterday. And then only after that, he got me in, actually. Um, and But I'm sure that a lot of our females around the world are facing the same problems uh, where we actually, uh, if you are, for example, the youth envoy, um, a lot of times the, um, the countries that she's visiting, for example, or the crews that she's working with, they think that she is actually the personal assistant for someone else's yeah. because the someone else can be the, pri the uh, youth envoy but not uh, her. And um, I think it, the same unfortunately happens with, with climate change, where we find uh, women and girls are in front lines um, of uh, climate crises, for example, especially in our community, because household uh, issues are mainly women's concerns. Um, so if we have a drought, then it's the women who walks like more than 10 kilometers a day just to bring uh, clean water. And um, I've heard an announcement from a recent study from uh, uh, Clean Cooking uh, Alliance says that actually 80% uh, of women who actually get um, uh, exposed to indoor pollution from cooking using charcoals and, and other wooding materials, um, not only them, but even their children get stunned and it 
brain damage them. Um, so it's us in the front lines, and if we have a crisis, then uh, gender-based violence, then um, early child marriage, and then FGM, and all of these things that we are trying to fight comes to um, to the stage and comes very obvious outside. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, I can simply say that crisis, climate crisis especially, but generally crisis is very um, gender-focused, unfortunately. That's a really key point, actually. And I think to, to the rest of the panel as well, um, how can businesses and world leaders work with organizations that Nazreen is part of and Extinction Rebellion and the Greta Thunbergs of the world to accelerate the work that they're currently doing on the ground? Do you think there should be a more collaborative approach and they shouldn't be so, so scared of welcome, welcoming them into those conversations and actually work together? Elena, do you want to go? Um, I think you know, there is a... Uh, um, uh, an opportunity to really invest in these collaborative efforts. And I think the UK government has uh, announced yesterday that they are um, creating a fund for 165 uh, million pounds to uh, support groups uh, on the ground. 45 million will be focused primarily on groups that focus on gender inequality. So, uh, you know, access also is uh, is linked to lack of, fi uh, of you know financial opportunities, right? So it's really important that you know the developed world you know supports uh, you know these groups financially because you know that will bring them to the table. I mean, I, I assume it might have been difficult for you to come to <laughs> to to cop, right? You know, and a lot of the activists I, I heard uh, talking about uh, in the last couple of uh, weeks uh, said you know it was challenging for them to even come here to to talk to, to to leaders and if you're not at the table nobody listens to you right so so that I think that's the first uh, first you know uh, item in the agenda you know financial support Jane, do you want to add on that as well? Sure. Anything in addition to what Elena said is that I think it's also we've we have an opportunity with the networks that we have and the businesses that we have to amplify mm. the work. I mean, I think we've worked so hard to to build and curate like-minded people and such in our um, in our networks that it, 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 if it's not used, then uh, it's it's a waste. So I think that's an easy thing to do. And social media has made it, I think, and all of the the types of technology easier to be able to to get the word out because it's. It's financial resources, but then it's just visibility. Mm. I think that access part is really key. Actually, I know Nizreen from social media, and because of that, I've learned more about the work that they're doing as a group and a collective. So I think that access point is so vital as well. Else we just won't know. In my realm, fashion revolution go above and beyond to amplify the voices of marginalized communities that are most targeted by climate change and climate crisis within fashion, that are garment workers that are just out of mind for a lot of people when they get dressed in the morning. Um, on the marginalized communities part, how do you think that we can have technology play a part here and what role can governments play in increasing that, I suppose with financial investment as well, but um, the, the technologies that are coming about due to climate change and climate crisis that are solving the problem is also in remote locations that is exploitative of that community. Um, how do you think we can overcome that and who is the person that we hold accountable and who do we look to to change it? Nizreen, do you want to add on that? Yeah, um, I just want to comment on the financial part first. Well, it's actually, there is a lot of finance out there, but it's so hard to access the finance. Mm. <laughs> mm. So accessing the finance is a problem itself, uh, let alone the, the financing. Um, every uh, in instrument, every institute, every bank, every government have um, a certain criteria to actually be able to access the finance. And unfortunately, this... not even calculate how much of this 0.8% goes to women and, and, and gender focus, for example. Um, and uh, we really need to find another formula to enable these communities to access funds, otherwise it will not work. Because in order to access funds, we have to have very much bankable projects written. Um, in order to have a bankable project written, you have to have a certain uh, l um, like level of education, and education itself is a problem. You have to have a very strong institutes that actually can 
receive the money and then implement the project. I mean, um, uh, this system is unfortunately not working for us because it, it end up the, the finance go end up goes to the communities that already have access to education and already, let me say, middle level um, communities, but not the very much marginalized, squeezed communities. Mm -hmm. Because if you are marginalized from education, from access to electricity, from uh, um, from access to the internal world, the external world, sorry, then of course you will not be able to access finance. Um, another example is in Sudan, we only 30% have access to electricity, 30%. So 70% doesn't have access to electricity. And I don't really think that the other 70% are able to even me, I struggle writing proposals to, to get funded for our organizations, for example. So let go of the other communities that um, are less privileged than I am. Um, and regarding the, uh, the social media and the internet, it's very important um, to highlight that the freedom to access to internet is not there everywhere. And unfortunately, it's the people who needs to be public outside doesn't have access to the internet. And I can give example to what was happening in Sudan right now. We have a military coup and we don't have um, uh, internet coverage since the 25th of, of, uh, of October. Um, so. I really think that addressing the problems and find uh, holistic solutions will not work because dif different contexts have different challenges and more zooming in to the reality of different communities, you will find that it's by far more challenging than we, we think it is. Um, and even saying that, for example, uh, we covered, a lot of reports says uh, we covered um, 100,000 women in Africa, for example. And when you try to look, you find that this 100,000 were only in Nigeria because Nigeria have a population of 200 million. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you are working with only Nigerian women, for example, just this is just an example, then you cannot say that you are working with African females or mm -hmm. African women because we have uh, 53 other countries there. Um, I'm only talking about the African context because I worked a lot there and I have a lot of information and exact figures, but I'm, I'm sure, I'm 100% sure that it's a similar situation of uh, other uh, continents and other places. Another final example <laughs> is Eastern Europe, for example. A lot of people think that Eastern Europe is similar to the rest of the EU countries, for example, and it's not the case. They, they have a lot of uh, inequalities comparing to their neighbors' countries, for example. And talking about uh, Europe as a sum lump or lump sum actually continent is not really working for their uh, different communities. So we really need to find more detailed solutions, otherwise it will not just work. Yeah, I think there needs to be more specificity in the terminology, in the investment, in the education, and in the conversations that are going on as well. On the access part as well, I think in sustainability in general, there's quite a class problem and this classism and elitism that you have to be a certain way and have a certain income to have access to be sustainable. Um, one of the questions that we've had from our online audience, is there a certain class divide that surrounds sustainable living and how might we overcome this perception? So. I, it, maybe we could touch on in terms of energy that every, uh, the vast majority of the UK have an energy provider, the vast majority of the UK have some sort of access to transport. How might we overcome this perception of elitism and sustainability? Penelope. That's actually something that my company's focused on. So if we don't address that question, Scott, what we're going to have is sort of an energy apartheid, and we're going to have the rich driving around in Teslas with their own um, wind generation um, assets, and the poor will be living in polluted, dirty, um, run-down communities. We can't afford for that to happen. If that happens, we won't meet the goals that we're all striving so hard to get toward. So I think to loop back to your question, your previous question about technology, this is where technology provides the solution to a sustainable future for all sorts of communities. I'm thinking of those 70% of Sudanese communities who don't have electricity. If they were to have their own um, solar panels, their own um, wind generation assets, if they were on the, the coast, if they were to have their own tidal assets, technology would allow them to um, map out those different pieces, bring them together. They would be energy self-sufficient, which means they wouldn't have to pay for their electricity. They could even be selling their electricity back into the grid if those um, infrastructures and systems exist. And then we start seeing less developed nations prospering, um, which enables them to get into education, um, which was mentioned. And that's really the key that we're looking for. So it's absolutely essential that we bring everybody on the energy transition with us. Nikki, do you want to add to that as well? 
I mean, really, I just echo everything everything you said. I mean, just from a, a personal perspective, um, 18 years ago, it was my, one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. I spent a couple of years um, in India, um, and when I was out there, we um, sort of actually put in some infrastructure in terms of solar panels. And I think your point around how the women really take the, the brunt of, of the household. I mean, it was a very enlightening experience for me um, because, you know, I don't come from that background. You know, I've, I've, I've lived in England. So actually seeing, you know, that the physical uh, so, sort of duress of going to get the water, the fact that when there was no electricity, they had to stop their carpet ma making. And, you know, for, for us to put in these solar panels, the complexity to get these solar panels in was, was just mind-boggling. I, I thought naively it would be quite simple because we had access, um, but we did get them in. And I think, you know, I, I, I can't sort of say it, say it any better than the, the two previous um, sort of speakers or commentators, but we really mustn't think that one solution is going to solve, solve all here. We've really got to look at this in terms of what is the actual issue in this context and then what's the solution? And we have got to have different approaches globally, for sure, even within the United Kingdom. Um, if I just sort of bring it back to home, I think that there is a danger, if we're not careful, that people who have you know, more understanding of this, perhaps more financial literacy, are going to be able to access grants, um, be they small businesses, you know, be they households. And so that's where we have got to make sure that we're really providing open, accessible routes to all aspects um, in terms of being able to make this a just transition. That is really, I, I think, where we need to, you know, that's absolutely where we need to get to. Geraldine, do you want to add on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I completely relate to what, uh, what was just said. Um, and I guess especially when you think about uh, the UK, we're not perfect either, right? So uh, as you just mentioned before, um, the EV transition, everybody's talking about it and it's great. However, in the UK, 60% of the population doesn't have access to a driveway. So even if they wanted to, they cannot do that right now. So that's one of our main missions at Connected Curve to really work with local councils, workplaces, uh, and many more organizations to try and bring EV charging on street for everyone uh, and offer solutions gonna be affordable, uh, accessible, and reliable, which helps when it works, uh, usually. Um, and uh, we actually just announced uh, Monday, so two days ago, that we've contracted 10,000 charging points on street. And that is something that's gonna be completely transformed completely, sorry, completely different for the market because it means that uh, when we've had so far 25,000 public charging points in the UK, so we've already contracted 10,000 and uh, we're right now believing that we're gonna be getting to 30,000 next year, which means that we're now getting to a point where hopefully we'll help uh, people getting access to EV charging, but it's more than that, it's also engaging with uh, local authorities and residents. Because I think we mentioned before, uh, we don't want to be creating a two-tier system mm -hmm. where only people that are wealthy are going to get access to a lovely Tesla with their home charger. That's absolutely not what we want to do. And what we want to do is uh, try to uh, relate uh, to residents uh, and uh, educate them about EVs and actually trying to debunk a lot of fake news uh, that are going around there. Uh, and we're talking about social status, but it's also geography. Uh, if you're looking into rural areas, mm. everybody would assume that everyone's got a driveway again and they're actually going to be able to have a home charger. That's it's not the case at all. So. Uh, as a company, we really try to look into uh, geography uh, and also in cities, uh, going back to your point regarding, uh, you know, higher uh, or really dense areas of cities. Usually they are the more, you know, the most polluted areas uh, of the cities. Again, they do not have access to any driveways. So it's just really thinking about, uh, you know, all those different areas and how we can help and how we can work with uh, local authorities to at least try uh, and make a difference. We're not perfect, but we're trying to get there. At yeah, least. I think that's really key, looking on authorities and governments to provide us with the solutions, at least that we can campaign for or, or you know, work towards some sort of benchmark or framework that we can. And I know Mark on the automotive panel was also saying 
the differences not just between London and the North, but East London and West London is completely different in terms of access to driveways or access to cars. So um, we are coming to a close. Yes, Jane. Oh, I'm sorry. Just to add one other thing. I mean, I think it goes back to the diversity and accessibility. Yeah. The others to consider here in, here in the UK, um, there are over six, 600,000 drivers registered on the Motability Scheme. Yeah. And these are folks who have some level of disability. And they're in the next, by 2030, all of those drivers will need to transition to some form of uh, electric mobility. And so it's thinking about how, you mentioned it earlier, how heavy is the charger? Where is the access? How, if you have a wheelchair exiting, how can you charge your vehicle? There, there's lots of things that need to be considered. And we're focused right now, rightfully so, we're at the early adoption stage, uh, you know, the Tesla example time and time again. But it, it needs to be much more thoughtful going forward for everyone. Totally. And as we do come to a close, I'd love to go around the panel again and either give um, some sort of takeaway to our audience, something that we can work on immediately, whether it's advice to recruiters or um, something that we can do together collectively. If you would, if we can start with Elena and go, go along. Mm. <laughs> or if we can start with Nazreen and come back. <laughs> Okay, um, well, I think uh, my take out from this is we all have different contexts and different challenges. Uh, but I mean, finding different solutions that actually uh, fits every reality is the only way we can actually succeed. Otherwise, it will be just solutions and needs with no match between both of them. And I really wish um, to have like to Sudan to reach the, the point where charging points is our only problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Agreed. I think, Scott, if I circle back to your very first question, which was, um, what are the barriers to uh, women getting those top seats in female leadership? I think if we do anything after today, it would be about re-examining our associations of how we um, think about leadership. Um, does it need to be hard-faced? Does it need to be bombastic? Could it, in fact, be compassionate, nurturing, um, gentle, patient, all of those traditional feminine qualities which I think are so essential um, for sustainable growth. So I would love to see more of that in the sector um, and it's been a real pleasure to participate today. Thank you. Thanks. Nikki. Great. Well, I, I would just add to that that, you know, I hope that everyone watching and everyone who's in leadership positions that, that they're curious, you know, curious to understand what people are thinking and why they're thinking it, that they're humble, you know, no one has got all of the answers that they actually will listen, so that they bring people into the right forums and they listen, and then they're going to act. We've got to act. Jane. That's a beautiful statement. There's, there's um, not much to add to that. I think, though, that I, I've, I'm just, first of all, incredibly inspired by the ladies that are here, and hopefully that energy and enthusiasm and intelligence and, and practical as well as aspirational um, reflects and, and inspires you uh, in the audience and others. Uh, I think it helps us do the work that, that we need to do. Um, and I think for my own um, inspiration here is to, to make sure that I leverage the types of relationships that I have and what I've built in a career to help those that, are, uh, that can benefit from it and, and become even more active. Sure. Geraldine. Yeah, I think the listening part uh, I thought was quite important, uh, especially when it comes down to younger people or younger generation. Uh, I think we tend to look down on younger people and I don't think it's going to be helpful really if we grow that gap between younger generation and older generation. And unless we really come together, we listen to each other and actually we share passion and expertise. Sometimes it feels like if you're really passionate, it means that you have no expertise. And it's really, really sad because mm -hmm. if the two comes together, at least we can start acting on things. Um, so that would be, yeah, that would be my thing. And thank you mm -hmm. for being part of such a lovely panel. And Elena. So I would say celebrate, you know, different role models, organize, you know, become an activist and then mentor, uh, you know, young people so that they can come and work with us to you know, change the you know, economic infrastructure we're all in. Awesome. And I think these are, it's important to note that this conversation isn't towards just female audience. And I think exactly. for, for me, it, it would be to address the men and the males that are also listening online that perhaps look like me to listen and check yourself and check what you're doing and what your behaviors are like and listen to these people here. Mm -hmm. um, so we are out of time today, but we are hoping to have these conversations far into many decarbonisation summits in the future. Um, thank you to all of our panellists for coming and uh, taking part in the conversation. Um, we know this conversation will continue to be had across this sector. 
Um, thank you all for joining us. We're going to take a short break now, and I'll be passing back to Aid for the next panel, um, which is science, innovation, and technology.